I look directly at something, it disappears. My central vision is gone. So it's not just this big void, this big giant hole. Our brains fill in the colors they think should be there. It's almost like you took a painting and you sort of smudged some of the paint into that big blind spot. I got the diagnosis in my early 20s and I wasn't yet ready to figure out what that meant and what to do with that. So I'm driving to work like I always do. And it's dusk, it's pretty dark out. People are starting to turn their lights off, you know, that time of day when you don't quite know. And the roads are calm and peaceful. And I pull up to the intersection that I turn left at every single day. And I look to see if a car's coming. Only you just saw what happens when I look at something. Nobody's there, so I turn left. And I'm struck by this massive pickup truck. Spin all the things with a car accident. But everyone was fine, and that accident became the catalyst for me to figure out how do I use my eyes? How do I shift my focus? How do I see better with what I have? We're gonna take that analogy into our leadership. Sometimes we're looking at something and we're missing what we need to see, and we have to be more intentional to shift our focus so that we actually see what matters. four categories we're going to discuss. Busyness, continuous performance fatigue, discouragement, and interpersonal conflict. There's a healthy level of being busy, right? We don't just need to binge Netflix for seven months after the pandemic and we're all supposed to be back at work and we're still sitting on our couches. There's a healthy level of busyness and then there's this frantic, frenzy, I don't know how to say no, I can't keep up and I don't feel good about it busyness. So when our eyes are focused on doing more, 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 sometimes we miss the truck that's coming at us. If we accomplish nothing else except for one thing in the next three months, what would we be incredibly proud of? And we know it would have made a difference. Saying no to many things so that you can focus on your top impact priority is better than trying to do a lot at a mediocre level and not actually having an impact. Continuous performance fatigue is driving. We're saying what's next, what's next, what's next. We're trying to go from here up to there. But in reality, it looks like this. So you're gonna draw your squiggly line because real life has things like pandemics and staffing changes and distractions. If you happen to be the leader who's pushing the continuous performance fatigue, take a breath and ask your people at one of those milestones, how's this going? Is this working for you and why did it work? And what should we do differently? The antidote to your continuous performance fatigue is celebrations. You have to celebrate. We've done this, we got two steps ahead. Yeah, we're trying to run a marathon, but like we did this, we got this far. And then when you get one more step, that's awesome, let's keep going. Another place we wanna shift our focus is discouragement. The cost of staying discouraged is our mental health, right? It's normal to feel sad, it's human to go, this sucks. We're talking about when we're discouraged, <sighs> acknowledging that feeling, not staying there. If reading the news in the morning ruins the rest of your morning, we've gotta shift our focus. Most of the time, interpersonal conflict happens uh, because of the fundamental attribution errors. Anybody familiar with this from social psychology? I am not a social psychologist, so I'm gonna give you the, I understand it like a five-year-old version. It basically says that my mistakes I attribute to the environment. Your mistakes I attribute to you and who you are. And social psychology says we all kind of do this. The most obvious example, if you're driving and I cut you off, in my head, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I'm running late, we had this crazy thing happen this morning where I'm going super important, I'll never do it again. The environment is the problem. But I cut you off, and do you know what you're thinking after you say a bunch of expletives? You say, you are so inconsiderate, you are such an unsafe driver. So you attribute my error to me. So what's tricky about this is if we know we do this, then we have to be very intentional to give people some space to make mistakes and have it not be about them and have us blame them. And that takes a lot of mental effort. The common place when we start to have that friction, that interpersonal conflict, the default focus is we look at a screen or other people, meaning we go gossip. When you are emotionally uncentered and triggered and frustrated, when you're uneven, 
you don't want to go have a face-to-face -face conversation with the person that you're emotionally frustrated with. So you have to find a way to get even first to have a productive conversation. Recognizing how you're feeling and taking a step back to breathe, to stand up, to go for a walk. Those sound so overly simple and yet they are life-changing. It's different for everybody. I know someone who walks around the building. I have learned that when she's walking, you're like, oh, she's triggered. <laughs> but that's so much better than, oh, she's triggered and she went to somebody else's office to gossip about it. She's walking so she can get back to even so that she can then lean in to what to do next. If you can eradicate the word should from your vocabulary, it will help your conflicts. Should is one of the most unbecoming words of us as leaders because it usually comes out like this. Well, they should have known. Says who? They should know to be on time. It's not becoming of us because we are abdicating our leadership so they should just know. I shouldn't have to tell them. But if people just knew everything you think they should know, then you would not need to be their leader. So if you get rid of the word should, then you start to say things like, did I give clear expectations? How could I make sure they know that for next time? I wish they'd automatically known that I expect them to be on time for meetings, but it's my job to continuously remind them. All the time as a leader, it doesn't matter what anecdote you're looking for, witnessing the good is where you wanna shift your focus. We talked about our top impact priority, that's witnessing the good. We talked about your celebrations of the milestones on the journey from here to there, that's witnessing the good. This can also look like affirming other people with specificity. And it sometimes feels fluffy, especially when you are someone prone to drive and achievement and busyness. So when you do this, what it looks like is a strength-based affirmation. Here's what we do as leaders. We go, hey, great job. Hey, we made it through that event. Hey, I'm so glad we met that strategic goal. Not helpful because it's not specific. Say someone's name because the sweetest sound to any human is their own name. So you have to do all three. One of your strengths, it can literally be, is saying hi to people in the morning. I saw this recently when you said hi to Phil and Jane before you hit your desk. This has a positive impact on our team because it changes culture in the office. People feel seen.